both the real prices and the imaginary prices of this category, the special kind of imaginary price, have the property that very, every so often there's a big price change. Mind you, these are financial prices, not prices paid in a grocery store uh, or at retail, which are entirely different and much more complicated story. And it is not either the pr price of oil, which is very much uh, influenced or determined by cartel, uh, the OPEC. These are prices of commodities, which are, which are simplified, normalized, uh, some kind of, uh, for example, securities, stocks, bonds, uh, or commodities, for example, um, American upland cotton, 15, 16 of an inch, which is the quality of cotton, and that is very actively traded. Every so often, for a good reason, or for no visible reason, these prices, pr prices change instantly by enormous amounts. Now, one sees that very much if um, one follows uh, a little bit, not very closely, the, the, the markets. For example, pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. at this point are subjected, right or wrong, to very, very close uh, supervision of everybody. And uh, if a medication is very good for millions of people, uh, but uh, every one out of uh, 10 out of a million die, well, it's not acceptable any longer. So, uh, some time ago, not so long ago, a big company had a pain reliever, which unfortunately killed a number of people. When this became public, the price of the stock of that company went down by one third instantly. Not rapidly, but instantly. It was a discontinuous function. Uh, when in some companies there is a very, uh, some, some very good new uh, boss comes in, the price can go up double because one trusts a new director, a new president is going to make the company work better. Or if, if, if a very good director dies in a, car, in a car or helicopter accident, the stock may go down because one expects them to be down. Then sometimes it goes up and down for no reason. But whatever the reason or lack of reason, one must understand that the phenomenon we're studying is intrinsically and fundamentally discontinuous, and that the discontinuities are a very, uh, the most uh, directly tangible aspect of it. Uh, in an article which I wrote with a friend of mine who has been for many years a very active trader in New York, um, we wrote an article in which we compared uh, an index uh, standard and poor, with what the index would have been if the 10 largest down prices, price changes in the last 10 years had not existed. So um, the last five years, prices went down many, many times, and you just eliminate the 10 worst at every point in time. Well, the index under these conditions would have more than doubled. In other words, Ten events are as important as, every, as everything else. Now, I would like to stop a little bit the discussion of, of prices for something much more uh, fundamental, which is um, a getting used to the notion of set of measure zero. Um, the idea of set of measure zero, uh, many of you know it, you, don't, you may not know it, but it's a very important notion which came up uh, around 1900, in particular through the work of Lebesgue and, and Borel. And uh, the principle is that in physics, you say if you have something which is true, except with a set for a set of measure zero, you can neglect the except. You can say it is true, because the set of measure zero means that once the blue moon, after a million years, you may, may be wrong, that's not important. In these things which I'm telling you about, the whole interesting stuff is effectively in sets of measure zero. Sets of measure zero can split into smaller and smaller ones. If that had been motivated by pure mathematics, it would have been viewed as a very interesting new line of pure mathematics. But it was actually motivated by very practical um, uses in the understanding of these phenomena. 
And so uh, the question arises, uh, given the, what the market is, uh, how, what, what happens in the long run? Because the, the usual argument for statistics is to say, well, on the lo- small run, short run, things go up and down all the time, but on the long run, everything averages out and nothing interesting is left. This is, again, the basis of very fundamental theorems, the law of large numbers, the center limit theorem, and other such immensely important results. Well, they are theorems. And a theorem is true when the conditions are true. When the conditions are not satisfied, the theorem gives you a wrong result. So how would you make the experiment here to see whether uh, the averaging out works? Well, instead of looking at these records to the right, which are perhaps a matter of five years, look at the 100 years to the left. Well, the 100 years, it's plotted a bit differently. I couldn't find the same plotting plot. But it has been equally uh, erratic. That is, prices do not average out very simply. Now, to finish this, uh, looking at this, at this um, diagram, look at the top line. The top line is, corresponds to the original Bachelier process, the Brian motion, which is an extraordinarily interesting mathematical construct, which I admire greatly and use all the time, but which does not apply here. Because on the top line, there are just a little bit, some points where it goes a little bit faster than elsewhere. But basically, it is just all within a strip. In the bottom, there are many, many points going up, then they are clustered, many things occur. Well, let me continue and uh, show you this thing very quickly. Uh, It's very important in all these cases when one navigates in the total unknown, because it was truly uh, uh, attention of everybody was so much concentrated on brown emotion that this was not considered. So it was very important to make cartoons, simplified pictures, which are not true, but which have some elements of reality. And so here you just have a a price which you interpolate recursively. Well, now uh, you you, you see cartoons. On top, you see something which is almost the same as brown motion. On the the bottom, something which is worse than in stock market. Stock market is halfway. But by tuning a single parameter, in this case, one number makes you go from one to the other. Well, here is various uh, ways of, of doing it, and I will not go into details. Here you can have discontinuities. Here you can have a strong dependence, positive or negative. All kinds of interesting things just by this, uh, this uh, argument. And here, something which is perhaps uh, for specialists, for people who have a more pointed interest in it, which is, uh, well, there is a, say, there is a quote uh, of former of the late former president Ronald Reagan of the U.S., who said after visiting a forest of redwoods that you have seen one, you have seen them all. They are all the same. That is, if you look at pieces of brown motion or white noise, it's very difficult to tell the difference. But these eight pieces are exactly the same in terms of structure. They look completely different. If you make the wrong analysis, you find that they are different. If you make the right analysis, you find they are the same. And so the, the key here is that fractals are not just a way of restating uh, old things. They are certainly very powerful in this context. Well, there's face, 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 space. I will not go in that. Um, these are experimental data. Uh, but um, the, uh, the main point here is this one. And then I will return to the beginning and to that exhibit. That roughness is a frontier that science long ignored, and now it must be faced. And it is not something which in a way improves our knowledge of optics or our knowledge of acoustics, but makes another human sensation, a very basic one, as basic as hotness, perhaps, accessible to investigation. And so here you have this very simple idea that roughness can be tamed and then at the same time, as I showed you by some of the few pictures of art, 
And as you can see by picture of fractals, which are all, all over the place, in particular this wonderful exhibit, the same kind of thinking is of such extraordinary beauty. So there is some hope in this in sense of uh, unity of, um, of knowledge, or more precisely, unity of knowing and of feeling. That, uh, that for, for daily work, it is indispensable to go into details, and details of everyday life are completely different for a mathematician, a physicist, or people in other fields. They must do it according to the field. But be behind these differences, there are some very basic similarities of structure. Now, I have taken a very complicated and rather dangerous uh, path in my life. Uh, I did not become a member of a well-defined community. Uh, I, in a way, uh, I can call myself a throwback, a kind of a, um, living organism which should have vanished long ago, who believed in solo science, the science one does by oneself, which means that in every field I've touched, I had to stop rather soon, because rather soon I became incompetent. I've done my contribution in the first, first few steps. And the, the, the fact that the themes of my life have been so completely different in one way and so completely identical in another is what I find so particularly striking. Now, this is the second time that I've been uh, invited to present, uh, to speak to this uh, International Mathematical Congress. The first time was in 1983, immediately after my book, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, which we see here the cover of. It was translated to Spanish and Italian and many other languages, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, etc., etc. Now, uh, at that time, all that was completely uh, unknown and unexpected. The only thing, the, the big message which I had then was that the mathematics which I had learned in school as being the monsters invented by Peano, by, by Cantor, by Sierpinski, by the great men of around 1900, these monsters in fact were not monsters at all. They were just good descriptions of the structure of the messiness of nature and of culture. It was not an, it was an early message. But as time went on, as more people took it up, it has proved to be a very strong one. Now let me go rapidly through some books. Uh, these, uh, these two books, and these two are a part of my selected papers. Uh, one of them is Mandelbrot set, one of finest, two others are on noises. Uh, this is a book which I published very recently, well, in English, I published uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, in Spanish, it just came out, uh, and in which um, I was joined by Richard Hudson, who was then a prominent uh, financial newspaper man, who was retiring from that job, I wrote the book together, in which my views of variation of prices are explained, and also my views of science, um, and also my views of the relation of mathematics and of reality. You may have noticed that unless I made a very bad uh, mistake, I did not use the following words. I never spoke of applied mathematics. I don't view myself as being an applied mathematician. As a matter of fact, almost nothing that I have done is classified as applied mathematics. 